Good afternoon. <clears throat> I haven't gotten used to daylight savings time, so I said good afternoon. Um, if you are in the back of the room, I am going to request you to fill into the front of the room, please. God forbid, that means you might need to get out of your seat and come to the front of the room. <laughs> please come to the front of the room, please. Appreciate you. Thank you, thank you. Good evening, and I want to welcome you to the uh, second in the fall of 2017 Jackie Robinson Art and Humanities Lecture Series. I took a couple of minutes to watch a, uh, a teaser for the overall series. Arts and Humanities Lecture Series at Pasadena City College has undertaken the incredible challenge of becoming the example of a lecture series, endeavoring to inspire, reassure, inform and empower all who enters its threshold. We have a dedicated set of faculty, staff and administrators whose main concern is to see to it that our students succeed. The Jackie Robinson Art and Humanities Lecture Series is an opportunity for this institution to tell a different story. It's an opportunity for this institution to tell a story about African-American excellence. It is for the students, it is for the community, and it takes a village of wonderful people to get this done. I, I just feel, honestly, tonight is food for my soul. No Nutrition. kidding. Nutrition. I feel... <laughs> mentally, spiritually awakened. Dr. Robert H. Bell, Vice President of Student and Learning Services, and Dr. Christopher David West, Diversity Initiative Coordinator, along with educators, a dedicated staff, students, activists, artists, both local and national, and the community for which the college serves, set a course to create a gathering place where everyone is allowed to express the anger the sadness, the joy, the wisdom, and the pride that shaped their existence. Obviously God wanted him, he believed in God, so obviously God wanted him to be by that pulpit so he could speak how he spoke. Because God knows that he, he had a preacher uh, style to him. I didn't want to go home and I didn't want it to end because I wanted to stay with them. The space provided by Pasadena City College not only provides a sound vessel for their journey, but also reminds the public and the school of its mission statement to help us achieve true greatness. Today is the day when you get up from here right now, you gotta figure out what your role is, like Jasmine is saying. And slide, and slide into Slide into it, yeah. and do it in a way where we're all connected, right? So I was raised in the days of bluebells and double dutch. Amazing performers and guest presenters, some seasoned, some gracing a public platform for the first time, utilize the space and time provided to them to tell their stories and to express, redirect, and voice their needs, their struggles, and of course their own personal and daily triumphs through art and activism. This ongoing interactive archival lecture series educates, engages, and entertains our students and our community. It serves as a proactive tool to show them and the world that there are people who will not stand for suppression and indignity. There are people and have always been people that have brought this to life through the arts and humanities, whether it was poetry, novels, music, sports, politics, theater, 
film, or new media. Okay, so don't let anybody tell you that you can't do what it is that you want to do. The technology at this point is so sophisticated that it is irrelevant. What matters is, who are you? The Jackie Robinson Arts and Humanities Lecture Series allows people from all backgrounds to demonstrate they are aware and that they care using what we do best to carry out this message of excellence and divine destiny and hopefully to remind Pasadena City College of its mission to pave the way to truly higher education. My training is as an historian, and um, it's, uh, since we're going to be working at thinking about archives, I think it's important to think about the contemporary moment. In the election of 1968, then uh, Richard Milhouse Nixon was in a very tough and contested campaign. The peace talks were going on for ending or at least closing down the Vietnam War, and there was a possibility that before the campaign would come to a conclusion, that peace would be signed and potentially change the 1968 campaign. Then candidate, Republican presidential candidate, Richard Milhouse Nixon, reached out to the South Vietnamese government and said, please don't go. It was a secret communique. Then President Lyndon Baines Johnson, because of intelligence information, realized that in fact that the candidate for the President of the United States had worked with a foreign power and that working with that foreign power had changed the election of 1968. What's fascinating is that within days of being elected, then Attorney General J. Edgar Hoover would begin to intensify the campaign against black nationalist organizations. He would send a communique to the Memphis office, March of 1968, instructing that office as 45 other field offices for the Federal Bureau of Investigation to please look for ways that we can work against nationalists. And in particular, the name was Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. That was sent to the Memphis office. He would be dead by April. The times that we live in, of course I'm not referencing in any way, shape, or form any parallels to the current president. I'm just a historian. This is what we do. But when we think about these things, I want you to think about the ways that archives are so critically important because they are the places where stories emerge. Archives are important because in many ways they only are the places where certain stories get told. And so when we dig into archives, we have to dig into archives to look for truth. There's no singularity of truth, but we've got to go into archives to ask good questions. We are in an age of trauma. And in an age of trauma, it is our artists, it is our writers, it is our poets who tell us that direction. And we have no better one tonight than the writer that's here. I want to take an opportunity to t thank the folks who helped to pull this together. Uh, the new dean of English, and I want to have her stand up and acknowledge herself and her family, please. <laughs> Welcome. Um, partner in crime, and she's the one who came in the middle of summer and just said, we got to make this happen. Emily Fernandez with the Creative Writing Program. Emily. <laughs> and we're going to have one of her students do the introduction. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Jessica Sanabria, and today I am here to introduce you to a very special woman, a woman who has not only inspired me, but motivated me because I am also a creative writing major and I find her work very interesting. Um, her book, Voyage of the Sable Venus, won um, a Natural Book Award and not only has she inspired me, but also other women out there who have, um, who feel we have come a long way as women, but we will continue to do even more. It is my honor to present to you guys the Los Angeles poet Loet um, Robin Coswell Lewis. Oh, everyone's always nervous. 
Hi, everyone. Yay! I'm so happy to be here. I've been looking forward to this for a long, long time. I've been uh, telling Emily and some of her students that I actually went to a junior college in, in the South Bay, Los Angeles Harbor College, and I have a very deep affection for junior colleges. It's my secret fantasy to teach in one, even though I teach at USC. Wait, is this being recorded? This isn't being recorded. Uh, I love teaching at USC. But I really, my heart is really in junior college and high schools. It's very important work to be done. And also the faculty who teach in junior colleges are sharp as tacks. I went to Harvard for graduate school. I have two masters and a PhD. And I just want to tell you the best education I've ever received has always been in junior colleges. So the moment I thought that I maybe could come here, I got really excited. So I'm very, oops, I'm very, very, very moved to be here. Thank you. Emily, you're amazing, and thank you to all the students. Um, so I'm supposed to give a lecture, and I'm also supposed to read some poems. And then when I got here and I looked around the room, I thought, huh, we'll see, because the lecture is a lecture, right? But uh, poems are exciting, right? It's just what it is. So um, Emily asked me to do both, which I'm very happy to do. I always like to make sure that um, the audience is happy. So I'm going to start with some poems, and then I'll read some excerpts from the lecture, and then I'll end with some poems, too, if that's okay with you. Emily, you're standing there. Do you want to say something to me? No. no. Okay. Um, also, uh, how many people are in Emily's class who read the book? Can you guys just raise your hand so I'll know? So do you guys have any requests? It's like calling the DJ, because uh, Emily asked me to read Art and Craft, Lure, Second Line, Anything else? Seriously, no? Well, you can always just, yes, please. Yes, darling. Perfection. I was going to start with Felicite. Yeah, anything else? Great. OK, so I was going to almost speak Creole to you and say this is for you, but um, never mind. This is for you anyway. <laughs> Um, before I start, thank you so much for having me here. I also want to say that um, every year of my childhood, I was born in Compton, and I have, like, I don't even know how many relatives in Pasadena, a lot, and Altadena, and every year in my childhood, I came and worked on the Rose uh, Bowl parade floats from when I was, like, six till probably 16. Every single year, I camped out in my cousin's uh, bedroom, and we pasted flowers on those floats every single year. Um, so I don't know. For so many reasons, Pasadena just has a very special place for me. Also, my uncle Charles, you guys might know, Charles Johnson, uh, died recently at 104. He was a Pasadena resident since 1923, and he uh, was a member of the NAACP from its inception until the day he died. And every time he saw me, he would say, niece, did you pay your membership? Every single time. So I want to dedicate this reading to him and my Aunt Eula, whose backyards I spent a lot of time in in Pasadena. Thank you for having me. This is Felicite. Of all 300 species of hummingbirds, only one, the ruby-throated, crossed the Mississippi. Somehow this matters to me. They can hover in midair. They can fly backwards. They fly 500 miles straight through across the Gulf of Mexico without ever landing. Their mouths are hollow, burnished needles, bright, sharp flutes. They sip the nectar of cactus flowers. When Louisiana meant all the land from the Pacific to the Mississippi, a grandmother of mine once owned one of the largest plantations in all of the territory. When Louisiana meant Spain, she had been a slave. When Spain sold itself back, she's listed as the sole owner of a vast plantation, a plantation so large many property lines now form the boundaries of an entire county. Tonight, after 25 years, I realize I've spent my entire life avoiding any situation that might require me to say these words aloud. From that moment, I discovered her rotting inside a molding courthouse, her signature next to the plantation's inventory, 
I began to babble any words I can think of in four different languages, placing them in the most chaotic order possible in order not to say these words. The black side of my family owned slaves. Or her signature, Marie Pani, Femme de Color Libre, Marie Panis, Free Woman of Color. Her lover was a famous judge from Sardinia. He took great pleasure in watching black women hanged inside the square to musical accompaniment. I read this about him once, then tried to see her, brown, sleeping next to him, fucking him on her plantation, on top of a pineapple bed, kissing behind his ears, sharing an alligator pear, strolling through her cane. Maybe at some point every hour, a part of me has wondered about her silently, though I did not think so until just now. Perhaps she is the answer to the sensation I've had for years, that of another body hovering inside me, waiting for a dress. What can history possibly say? Sometimes I feel a pride I cannot defend or explain, Sometimes I smile. Into the barbed nectar of this story, I have stared my whole life. Whenever someone tried to kiss me, I tucked her name under my tongue. If someone tried too long to hold me, I hid her between my legs. If they wanted to touch me there, I'd pull out her name and place the white bone under my pillow, hoping she would return, take it away, leave me a glistening quarter. To her son, Théodule, Marie Pani gave her favorite slave, a girl named Félicité. They were married. One of their children, Héloïse, was my grandmother's great-great-grandmother. There is a picture I found of Héloïse once, corseted in a studio, standing next to a waist-length pillar which held a verdant fern. But mostly, I have wondered, how does one name a slave happiness? Happiness had a twin sister, Francoise. I don't know what happened to her. Perhaps she is still out there, like us, her throat glistening, a silent red. Or perhaps she is the only one who can still cross the river, the only one still flying backwards over the gulf without landing. Um, I've been uh, touring for the past two years, and often people ask me what was the, um, what archive, right, what area of research, what material archive did, uh, did I find to be the most rewarding? And I've been thinking about that question a lot because you never know what you're going to find when you're doing research. Right, you guys probably have that experience when you work on your papers for college. Um, but I realized that the richest archive for me is memory. Um, and it's great that the archives are there and I use them. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read some work from them. But the human body, I think, is uh, a, a particularly rich place, uh, and, and memory most especially. Um, one of the poems that's in my collection is called Dog Talk. And um, it's based on a childhood language that we spoke when we were children. My family's from New Orleans. I don't know if you guys have gotten to study the Great Migration yet. If you don't get a chance, please insist upon it. It's one of the most important migrations of human beings on the planet. Um, and as a part of that migration, my family came, as many families came, from Louisiana to Los Angeles or Louisiana to California. Um, but every summer, people would go back, right, as families do. And the children would bring in their mouths, totally separate from the adult's experience or their parents' experience, childhood languages. Every summer, there was a flood of different childhood languages. And everybody had to learn them. And then, you know, for the whole year, we would speak those languages. One particular language, dog talk, stuck. And um, my sister and I still speak it. I'm 53, she's 57, so you can imagine. And now my son has picked it up too. But I thought about, I think about this language a lot because I, um, one of my graduate degrees is in a ancient language called Sanskrit. 
And uh, when you study the ancient world, there's all this fantastic research, speaking of archives that scholars are doing. And now, in the last, I would say, two decades, scholars are doing a lot of research on child, children's games in the ancient world. Like, forget the monuments. We'll talk about monuments, I'm sure, tonight. Forget the monuments. Look what these kids in, you know, engraved or rubbed out in a statue in Rome. Or look at this inscription where they, you know, carved through some letters to make some really funny Roman graffiti, right? So more and more scholars are becoming aware that children actually are the arbiters of more culture than we could possibly understand. And so I think about dog talk, the language, as an artifact of the Great Migration. Um, it was a way for sure that everybody in the neighborhood um, kind of assaulted adult, adult authority. You know, they had no idea what we were talking about, which was great. But it's also an archive, right? It's, language is an archive in and of itself, you know? And it's also, Dog Talk was also an archive of a moment in history where particular families made this migration. And so I wrote this poem um, in Dog Talk, and I'll translate it for you afterwards. Dog Talk. We be bo broke a beverage be a billo bo bo bo. Our barm of valves were broke the bim a ban a bopa bin the bim for bore a bear, or bore were barterbur, or bore sabid, or bore fubud. A ban sabers, kobeshtabins, nabame, sabikribits. We be but bent a bing labish, a bib embraced a bit, the bin above a based a bit, a bat the bus a bame to bime. I call this dog talk for dummies, it's not in the book. I'll translate it for you. <laughs> we broke every syllable. Our mouths broke them and opened them for air or water or seed or food. Answers, questions, names, secrets. We bent English, embraced it, then erased it at the same time. <laughs> Thank you. And since we're talking about the Great Migration, I'm going to read a poem. Oh, Emily, I'm going to read it now called Second Line. It wants to be read now. Second line, and it's dedicated to my father and my son, both named Henri Louis. And then one day you fell and broke your neck just like that while taking a shower. Afterward, you walked back to your chair and asked about the length and color of the weather lady's skirt. It was brown. When the ambulance arrived, you told them to go on home. You were fine. Two hours later, you slumped over and still it took them three more days to realize you had severed your spine because the whole time you told jokes and wouldn't quit smiling. Pull my finger. Stoic and stolen so early on, what is it about veterans of the Second World War that makes death require more convincing? Three months in ICU, a broken neck, eight heart attacks, a clement stream of steady infections, and yet there you were, still 84, in a coma, batting your eyelashes nonstop in full speed at the world. Even while dying, you would not die, so we were forced to kill you. But then we put on Ray Charles, and just when they pulled the plug, he began your favorite song, Hit the road, Jack, which you did. You hit it. Before the song could end, you were gone. I have never been so proud as I was that morning, watching your breath, second line home so quietly. Except for that day when I first started my period and was ashamed. Nobody would go and buy me anything because they said it all came with the new messy territory but you drove me right up to the store and said, stay in the car, then came back out with the paper bag. When you fell, it was the first month of spring, March 13th. That day, I climbed up into the air and could not climb back down until just now. So how do you call that body born colored and male, hunted and used for cog and prey? Tree adornment? altar cloth, war fodder, 
and still somehow came laughter, often and more eagerly than fear. Your one half good eye forever fixed and cocked on the wry glint of the world. When I was four, you showed me how to play tonk and the proper way to throw down a bone and score with sound. When kindergarten began, they had to skip me two grades because you'd already taught me when and how to double down. That's what it felt like to be Negro me, daughter of colored janitor you. Pi, the mathematical number, pi, was not a pastry. History was not a book. It was a smell like damp cinnamon in your blue work shirt. Starched pans, union, crawdad, crab boil, oysters shucked and soaking in their primordial liqueur. It smelt like all of this, and the view carré, its thick, peculiar cotton air, breaking beneath the sea's sloppy canopy. It smelled like the last high note of the market woman's song sing song whenever she cried fresh strawberries. History was the smell of dirty whites soaking in a hot tub of bleach, and your first whore, that nice girl from Storyville who Anc Felix took you to see when you were a randy gentleman all of 14. History was the morning of your first communion, marbles and cigarettes pocketed inside your muslin altar boy gown. It was the smell of gunpowder from the small pistol you hid in your sock to protect your brother Lucian and other Negro doctor friends while they tended the colored sick and shut in. It smelled like a palmetto tree, like every tree red with sap, warm with wonder, and holy things which are common and plain. A brown paper bag, okra by the crate, the ironing board when left in a room to cool. My pencil you sharpened with your switchblade each morning before I left for school. I sensed all these things, the countries you'd seen, but I had never been. I could smell the world all over you, Daddy. You gave it to me, a fresh, sharp walnut, pungent and coy. You cracked it, plucked out its intelligence, then dropped it in my hand, this deep black joy. Thank you. And then I was also told that some of the students wanted to hear this poem, Art and Craft. I would figure out all the right answers first, then gently mark a few of them wrong. If a quiz had 10 problems, I'd cancel out one. When it had 20, I'd bite my tongue, then leave at least two questions blank. A B was good, but an A was too good. They'd kick your ass, call your big sister slow, then stare over your desk as if you'd snaked out of a different hole. Knowing taught me quickly to spell community more honestly. L-O-N-E-L-Y. During arts and crafts, when Miss Larson allowed the scissors out, I'd sneak a pair, then cut my hair, to stop me from growing too long. Thank you. You guys don't have to clap. You don't have to clap. <laughs> That's sweet. Um, I'm going to read a couple more. Any more requests before I move on? No? OK. Um, I'm going to read a couple more, and then I'm going to read some from the title poem, and then I'm going to read some excerpts from a lecture. Good with you guys? Okay. What I really want to be doing is dancing under a disco ball with you all, just so you know. <laughs> um, anybody ever see the, the real movie, The Wiz, not the second movie, The Wiz? Anybody ever see the real one? The first one? I shouldn't call it the first one. Who, who hasn't seen the first one? Come on, raise your hands, for real. Who hasn't seen it? Because then I'll explain. Okay. Yeah, Michael Jackson. That's right. Michael Jackson's breakout. <laughs> Okay, good to know. Okay, I'm going to come back to that in a minute. This is summer. Last summer, two discreet young snakes left their skin on my small porch two mornings in a row. Being postmodern now, I pretended as if I did not see them, nor understand what I knew to be circling inside me. 
Instead, every hour I told my son to stop, stop with his incessant back chat. I peeled a banana and cursed God, his arrogance, his gall, to still expect our devotion after creating love and mosquitoes. I showed my son the papery dead skins so he could know too what it feels like when something shows up at your door twice telling you what you already know. Um, and um, I'm actually a really nice person. <laughs> <laughs> but I am enraged by the um, lack of generosity in our engagements with history, in the history of this country. And so history plays a very large part in my work. And uh, if you're from any kind of community or country or category that has been uh, oppressed in any way, of course that oppression is often denied for the grand uh, master narrative. And so a lot of my work is about offering correctives, hopefully elegant ones, to kind of sneak past the radar so I can actually get some historical recovery done. Um, beauty is very important to me. Elegance is very important to me. I, I found from doing the research for this book and for the long poem that I haven't begun to read from its 70 pages, 79 pages, um, that beauty perhaps is the greatest territory of all that we fight over, more so than nations, more so than energy, more so than resources. It's actually what gets to be cherished and what doesn't. You can just look in the press and see on what's on the first page and what's on the last. It's the same conversation. Um, one of the things that does not get cherished are women's bodies. And as we've, we've seen lately in the news, I've been paying a great deal of attention to this administration's responses to sexual assault and rape, which is to say there aren't any. Um, and so everywhere I go, I try to read this poem called Verga. Um, Verga in Italian and Spanish means both, it's a very etymologically very interesting word. It means both rod and stick on the one hand and virgin on the other. You're supposed to laugh. <laughs> I'm gonna do that again. It means both rod and stick in one hand and virgin on the other. Okay? Don't you think that's strange? I think that, that is the strangest thing. Anyway, so, um, there's a story behind this. Maybe we can talk about why I wrote this poem um, in the Q&A. There's a story that has nothing to do with this poem. And I love it that, that art, it, uh, art often comes from our mistakes or it comes sideways. Emily Dickinson talks about telling it slant. So um, this is a poem called Verga. It has an epigraph um, from Abshira Adin Muhammad, and it was taken from her in Kenya in 2000 um, from the Dagaheli Somali refugee camp, and it's in a book called A Camel for the Sun. This is an excerpt from her testimony. Women don't want the men to go into the bush because the women will only be raped, but the men will be killed. I have seen a woman who was caught in the bush by several men. They tied her legs to two trees while she was standing. They raped her many times, and before leaving her, they put stones into her vagina. Verga. Before leaving her, they put stones in her vagina. The men will only be raped, but the stones will be killed. The bush caught many men to go into the stones. The stones would be killed by several trees before leaving. The bush tied the men to the trees in their vaginas. Before bush go to trees, they kill many stones. Many men will be caught by the trees in the bush. Several trees will be raped by the bush and killed. Only the caught men will be stoned and bushed by the trees. Several men were caught by the trees before leaving. The men will be killed, but the stones will only be treed. The stones put many trees into the men's killed vaginas. By the bush, the trees were raped only several times. Before leaving, the vaginas were seen standing in the stones. I'd like to dedicate that to President Trump.
Thank you. So I'm going to read some, a few um, excerpts from my title poem. Um, let's see, how do I explain it? So the title poem is 79 pages. It's called Voyage of the Sable Venus. That title, Voyage of the Sable Venus, comes from a late 18th century etching. Um, where in, it's a redux of Botticelli's Venus, the famous Venus, right? And that's in uh, Florence. Uh, except that it's a black woman in the middle of the shell instead of a white woman, black goddess Venus. Um, immediately you should say, what do you mean it's in the middle of the shell? It's the 18th century. How could a black woman be the center of any, be the subjective uh, center of any image at all in the West? Um, and so when I first saw it, I was like, whoa. And then I looked very closely, and what I found is that Neptune, so she's, she's being attended by all these classical and celestial figures. And anyway, Neptune was carrying, instead of a trident, he was carrying a flag of the Union Jack. So it turns out it was a pro-slavery image, which you don't really get when you first see it. Um, and then I did research, and it was based on a poem that was written five years before that talks about how to rape a white woman and to rape a black woman is the same. Again, this is now 1782, because in the dark it doesn't matter, you don't need to see them. So it's a pro-slavery image, it's a pro-rape uh, poem, and I was like, what is happening, right? And then, after I got over, not got over, but kind of let that sink in for several years, I decided, well, Voyage of the Sable Venus, though, that's a title, if ever there was a title, right? And then I started wondering about other art titles. What did they look like? What, that, anything that contained a black woman, what were those titles? And so over the years, about somewhere between, I don't know, seven and 10 years, I did research where I just wrote thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands and thousands of titles down of any artwork, object, image, fountain, map, anything that had a black female figure in it, on it, around it. And I took all those titles together and I thought, I'm gonna try to tell the story of the black female figure, so the black woman in Western art, using only the titles. You guys with me? It's confusing. So I took all these titles and basically I sat with them for years and tried to rearrange them so they would tell the story for me. Because I found that the titles are actually, speaking of archive, the titles were archive, Forget the visual work, right? The titles were the archive themselves. And that fascinated me how, well, I'll read something from the lecture to go on. But first, before I do the lecture, I'm gonna read a couple of poems. It's supposed to be weird, okay? You're supposed to go, what? The actual, you know what, is she talking about? You're supposed to feel disoriented. When they, uh, when Gwendolyn Brooks, the great poet, if you haven't read Gwendolyn Brooks, read Gwendolyn Brooks, read Gwendolyn Brooks, read Gwendolyn Brooks. When Gwendolyn Brooks was asked about her sonnet, Gay Chaps at the Bar, that she wrote in the 40s, uh, they asked her why were all her sonnets ending in slant rhymes or off rhymes, right? She goes, I end my sonnets in off rhymes because it's an off rhyme situation. <laughs> so this poem is intentionally weird because it's a very weird situation art history, the art historical canon. <laughs> so the poem is 79 pages, as I said. It goes from the ancient world into the postmodern world. I'm going to read a poem from the ancient section, a poem from the colonial section, and maybe a poem from the postmodern section. Towards, when we get to the postmodern period, um, I, I started using artwork by black women, whether they, it contained a black figure or not, because I just wanted to make an homage to that incredible history. Um, and you'll notice that the subjectivity, it starts off in a very crazy way, and then the subjectivity starts to come in um, in really wonderful ways. So this is from Catalog One, Ancient Greece and Ancient Rome. It begins with an epigraph from Mahmoud Darwish. Here is your name, said the woman, and vanished in the corridor. This is from Voyage of the Sable Venus, catalog one. Statuette of a woman reduced to the shape of a flat paddle. Statuette of a black slave girl, right half of body and head missing. 
head of a young black woman fragment from a statuette of a black dancing girl, reserved head of an African princess statuette of a concubine, full length figure of a standing black woman wearing earrings, statuette once supported an enguant vase, vase with neck in the form of a head, of a black statuette of a female figure with negroid features, figure's left arm missing, head of a female full length figure of a Nubian woman, the arms missing, bust of a draped female facing forward, one breast exposed, black, Adolescent female with long curls and bare breasts wearing a voluminous crown, partially broken young black girl presenting a stemmed bowl supported by a monkey. I forgot to say that the whole point is that you're not supposed to be able to tell where one title ends and another begins. So there's that too. Also from the ancient period. Standing female reliquary figure with crested coiffure and hands clasped in front of torso, holding a staff surmounted by a human head. Figure has prominent vagina bended, knees and oversized head with half open eyes and semicircle mouth that juts out from the face. Some fine scarification on chest and belly, dark brown, almost black, patina with oil oozing in several places. Numerous cracks on back of head and hole on the coiffure one nipple appears to be shaved off or damaged black woman standing on tiptoe on one end of a seesaw while a caricatured figure jumps on the other end. For time's sake, I'm just going to move to the colonial period. But so each catalog is about 10 pages, 15 pages. I should say on my way to the colonial period that the one place where I found, where I, that shocked me and I found praise and adoration was in the Christianity period. Can you guess why? Anybody guess? Guess what is one of the oldest continuous uh, practices within Christianity that regards black female figures? I went to divinity school and I couldn't guess. What? You're talking about the Sisters of the Holy Family. Yeah, the sisters of the Holy I have relatives who were Sisters of the Holy Family. Very good. That's not what I'm talking about, but that is, but that's fantastic. The Black Virgin. She's one of the most continually um, adored black deity, I mean, de female deity, sorry. Continually adored female de deity all over the planet. You can't go to any continent where she is not still worshiped. I didn't know that, I mean, I knew that, but I didn't know just how deep that rabbit hole went because she's not in the museum, she's in churches and, and cathedrals. The, the country that adores her the most and will give its life for her and has is Poland, right? It's a fascinating history. There's a whole catalog in here about that. I'm not gonna read it, but I just want you guys to keep that in your minds, okay? That's the only moment in this long poem where there's adoration of the black female figure. Um, this is from the medieval colonial catalog for Mil Años de Creatividad. Alabama sketchbook, seated Negro woman looking to the left, drawing half-length image of a young Negro woman wearing a dress with an empire. Waistline and pearl, earrings and necklace and holding a basket of flowers over her left arm, painting the slaves escaping through the swamp, the slave watching her pursuers in for... Uh, 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 Ground, black woman walking in front of a board fence, background plantation house and outbuildings or slave quarters. In a grove of trees, slave woman wearing a runaway. Collar with two children emaciated. Negro man eating dead. Horse flesh in the background. Negro man strapped to a ladder, being. Lash slave woman seen from the back, her head and left profile, kneading bread and smoking a pipe, parrot, vendor, negress. Carrying her young slave woman, carrying baby and Negro boy, running. At left, Negro man, at right, being. Held by the collar, two dogs wear collars. One labeled Cass, the other expounder. The mulatress African woman with her basket, Congo basket full of fruit, diamonds sluicing the drape jewel. Laudanum, aspiration. The mask of blackness, work on progress into bondage. bondage. 
tall figure Lilith, the goat tender of the colonies, a Christmas gift to old master and missus. Merry Christmas and Christmas gift, old master. Broken chains, I'm sorry. Merry Christmas and Christmas gift, old master. A black child wearing broken chains and blowing him a kiss. There was one object I came across really towards the end of my research um, quite accidentally, and it was so, so heinous, I thought I would just make a poem out of the description of the object itself. When the woman's left earring is pulled, her eyes recede, and a mechanism rises into place, showing the hour. In the right eye and minutes, in the left, the right. When the right earring was, I'm sorry, the right earring was originally designed to release a musical movement with the pipe, organ, and the bass. It was a clock. If you pulled her right ear, the right, you guys got it? The eye receded and the time came up in the eyes for both hours, minutes. Le foi, the terror, full length. Figure of a Negro woman holding her child over her head out of reach of a serpent climbing up her dress. And then, so I'm skipping over independence movements, civil rights movements, all of that. I'm going to read just a couple from the um, postmodern period. Catalog 7, I call this modern posts because there were so many posts that I found made of black women, right? Columns and posts everywhere. Modern posts, it has an epigraph from Lou Reed, and the colored girls go do, 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 do. Landscape, Western Hemisphere, Le Tumult Noir. Spiral, okay, wait, one thing. So now you're listening to only titles by black women, paintings by black women, mostly paintings, video, some sculpture, okay? So again, all you're hearing are titles that I've tried to make into a narrative. Landscape, Western Hemisphere, Le Tumult Noir. Spiral, arteries in the female body, evidence of accumulation, empirical construction extending horizontal forms, delirium, wake, and resurrection, landscape, allegory, suprematist evasion, black city convalescence from somewhere. My irony surpasses all others. Have you any flesh, colored silk stockings, young man? Still life, wild, foul, deaf witness while you wait. I embody everything you most hate, and fear, African, African, an anti-slavery meeting black tie cement ball, an opera in three acts. I have special reservations between me and the rest of the land. There are bars, something brown, carmine and blue, middle gray, gray area, green heads, brown heads, an untitled brigade, stadia circulation style in spades. Red Opistics, Troubled Island, Zero Canyon, Typology. Do you think A is B, boy, girl, red ball, slave girl in holiday attire, slave girl with jade doves, comb with birds, phoenix segregation, enough reframing the past. I sell the shadow to support the substance runway. Thank you. I'm gonna just keep going. Dick and Jane with me, page spread, the upper room two, flip side self. Untitled female drinking figure, reclining silent protest parade. The result of the 15th Amendment ritual and revolution self-possession. Invisible black Russians, girls with guns, linen watch from the tower. This is my life cutting up old film. Don't edit the wrong thing out. Untitled world's exhibition being the narrative of a negress and the flames of desire. What remains inside Pandora, mechanical girl? Rabbit hole, fingerprints, secrets, tales of amnesia. I see it every day, the conscience of the court, woman in interiors, plate one, wedding night, untitled Venus, looking into the mirror, the black woman asks. Mirror, mirror, on the wall, who's the finest of them all? The mirror says. Snow White, you black bitch, and don't you forget it, Sphinx. <laughs> For time's sake, I'm going to read one more, and then I'll read a few paragraphs from the lecture, and then I'll stop. This is a subtitle, Brown Girl After the Bath, Apex Beauty School. 
Darky Town Rebellion, Tit for Tat Brooch, Cut, Beat, Burn, Balance, Consume, The Rich Soil Down There, The Bush Shen Deboning. You don't know where her mouth has been? Blackberry woman seated, woman in a blue and black dress. Stars and fireworks woman, feeding bird woman, brushing hair. Bathsheba at the fountain, Venus before, a mirror. Three wishbones in a wooden box. Hip, hip, hooray. Look away, look away. Day was nice, white folks, while they lasted, says one gal to another. Um, and then I'm going to read the last poem called The Present, Our Town, Catalog 8. Still life of flowers and figures, including a Negro servant. OK, so um, thank you. So uh, my, my paperback is coming out, yay, in another month or two. It's very, I didn't know I'd be so excited about it. But uh, when it does come out, they're including a lecture um, called Boarding the Vo Voyage. And I'm just going to read a few parts of it. Give me five minutes. I know I'm over time well, right now. Five minutes, OK? Boarding the Voyage. And it has an a epigraph from Rilke, one of my favorite poets. Read Rilke, you guys. Brilliant, brilliant poet, if you haven't. Uh, I know that nothing has ever been real without my beholding it. All becoming has needed me. My looking ripens things, and they come toward me to meet and be met. That's Rilke. Okay. So this essay is about, this lecture is about my research process. People all often ask me, how did you get all those titles? Where did you go? What did you do? How did it feel? This is what this essay is about. By the end of it, I was on my knees. I'd enter a museum, drop to the ground, and ignore the art completely. I had learned. The art itself had taught me. Art made me kneel. It was my last day in the museum. A new exhibit had just opened, an exhibit of American colonial furniture. I was there to research an Egyptian temple, but ran quickly upstairs to see this new exhibit. I knew what to do now. I didn't look at the image. There was no need. Instead, I walked into the gallery, dropped to the ground, and crawled along the floor. Why would anyone desire to carve the foot of a black woman at the end of a table leg? Why would anyone find it pleasurable to sit upon a chair whose legs, instead of a simple, elegant form of smoothed wood ornamented with dahlias or peonies, say, had been sculpted into the shape of four miniature black women, their hands extended high above their heads, four miniature black female chair legs to hold up the sitter? Which kind of sensation did it create to place the backside of one's body down upon a seat supported by eight wooden brown miniature female hands? A small black female carved into the handle of a tool, miniature black women who could fit into your palm, a three-inch long black female carved into a knife handle so you could hold onto her body tightly whenever you sliced your daily bread. A palm-sized black woman in your hand when you brushed your hair at night, looking absently into the mirror. A spoon handle, a drum, a hammer, a flute, black body sculpted into the wooden frame surrounding a heroic painting of a white male on top of a white horse riding triumphantly into war. Black female bodies ornamenting the tripods, the base of a table, sleeping inside the frame, selling, offering, tending in the background of innumerable paintings. Bending, standing, waiting, ever a neck or a hand or a bending face, tilting from behind a column, over a shoulder, from the margin, bringing the horses, carrying the hats, carrying the master's sword, his helmet, pulling back his curtain, holding a map, holding a glass filled with cold water, offering a bouquet of flowers. And all the countless, countless European stone fountains, supported by submerged black torsos, holding up all the world's water. Our whole artistic history crawling with the decorative bodies of black women. In Italy, in Florence, hangs the birth of Venus, perhaps one of the world's most celebrated paintings. The goddess Venus stands naked inside a tremendous scallop shell. And I need to, I'm going to skip that, so I, I don't want to keep you guys. In the background, there is an outline of a shore. In the foreground, another female figure, also white, but this time with darker hair, this time fully dressed, awaits Venus's rival. She arrivals. She holds open a brocade floral tapestry with which she gestures to cover the goddess's nakedness. Below. 
the, uh, sorry, the goddess's nakedness. The wind bellows inside of everyone's garments, creating the sensation of motion, and hence, perhaps more than all, Balicelli's painting of Venus is actually Time's portrait too, like a photograph, time stands captured static, like a statue. When I was a child, looking upon this Venus, I would think that predictable thought. I want to stand inside a giant shell. I want red flowers to fall from the mouths of clinging angels from heaven. I want to hover, too. But what I didn't know was that the original models used for earlier paintings of Venus were Alexander the Great's mistress, Kampaspi, as well as an ancient Greek courtesan named Firni. It's just ancient gossip, I know, but apparently Firni was so rich that after Alexander the Great destroyed the walls of Thebes, she vowed she would rebuild every brick but upon one condition, that an inscription be engraved upon the new wall's face for everyone to see. Destroyed by Alexander, restored by Firni, comma, the courtesan. It's a fantastic story, but what a lush world our psyches might have become had we known the goddess Venus, the ultimate emblem of female beauty in the Western world, was originally modeled after a mistress and a whore. Thank you. Um, we're going to have Q&A now, yeah? Are we still doing that? And there's a mic over there if you guys want to come up. And if you don't want to come, you can also just ask questions or comments from your seat. Yes, ma'am. Um, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. okay. um, I teach creative writing, poetry mostly. Yeah, sometimes I teach visual, visual studies stuff. I, uh, I did my PhD in poetry and visual studies, so sometimes I'll, I, I teach classes where uh, text and image converge in a book. Some of my favorite books. Yeah. Yeah, great question, sure. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Thank you for Sisters of the Holy Family. Never in my life has anyone ever said that. Yeah, that's a very interesting thing. Um, you said you were related to us. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just, I was gonna kind of further that. Uh, sure. What, what part of Louisiana, what parts of Louisiana was your family from? And uh, how much like impact does that have on your storytelling or even interpretations of other stories, rather. God bless you. Thank you. Uh, my family on both sides um, is from New Orleans. My mother's side is from the West Bank, so Algiers. For those of you who are from um, Arab countries, you should start to go, wait, what, did she just say her family's from the West Bank in Algiers? Because it was colonized by the French and f you know, like most colonial powers, they go around naming and saying, the, the, the whole earth is saying, names over and over again. So yes, my family's from Algiers, I'm from the West Bank, haha. Ha. Um, and then my father's family is from the fourth ward in New Orleans. So if anybody knows where Dookie Chase is, my, fa my father grew up on that corner, the famous restaurant. Yeah, um, and how does that uh, affect how I look at the world? Well, first of all, so my father and a lot of uh, the generation above him spoke Creole, right? And so I saw a language die in my lifetime, in my family, that was incredibly sad. And I always felt like I was racing the clock. I never learned it. I know how to curse. <laughs> Perfect. Um, um, and, and so I think it wasn't a coincidence that when I got to college, I started studying post-colonial literature. I wasn't at all conscious. I was too young to know that I mean, now, like, it makes perfect sense. I'm in my 50s. Like, of course, because Louisiana was handed over between three nations twice, right? So, of course, you study post-colonial literature. So, especially uh, literature from African countries, especially women like Amata Adu, Noel Sadawi, uh, Bessie Head, South, the great South African novelist, all those, the Heinemann catalog that's no longer taught, unfortunately, um, all that post-colonial literature from Africa, the Caribbean, and then South Asia. Um, I'm a Sanskrit, I was a Sanskritist in another life, so um, I read a lot of um, South Asian uh, novel in English, South Asian poetry, um, anything that had to do with migration and mobility, I, I like an, a, a lot of scholars are now, tend to think that it's actually not stability that what human beings do, it's actually m mobility. We don't know, I mean there is no floor. The, the book I'm working on now is about the Arctic, and, and I think the reason why I got so attracted to it is that, you know, 
duh, I, I, went, I, went, I went through LAUSD, so I didn't know that, which is to say I'm dumb as hell. Um, I, didn't know, I didn't know that uh, the Arctic Sea was all frozen ice for the longest time. So when I finally figured out that these, this whole history of humanity took place on land that is not land, but really water, I got completely attracted to it allegorically, right? Um, and so that's what I'm writing about now, but it makes perfect sense to me because, again, there are people who are in this precarious situation, but doing more than surviving, they're thriving beautifully, right? Regardless of all the ruptures of empire. Um, and so any literature like that, I'm also interested in literature of the frontier and literature of exploration, I think, for all the same reasons. You know, I have a very weird mind. I, I finally have learned to love it as opposed to just like I'm just weird and it's fine. Um, but that took a long time. But so um, I think it also helped me because of the, uh, all the ways in which Louisiana changed so many uh, hands in terms of colonial powers. I think it also helped me to locate African Americans within a larger or longer colonial context, which is very important. Because, you know, if, if people had their way, we would just think that we, like, only began 400 years ago. That is, that is so smart. That is, in terms of, like, keeping people down, that is some smart, that's, that's brilliant. It's brilliant. So we didn't begin, we have no other beginning but in a position of absolute heinous um, abuse. It's, it's just insane. And so because of my studies in post-colonial literature, it kind of broke through that myth of inception. And so whenever I hear people, Claudia Rankin's a dear friend of mine, and we were on this panel once, and somebody's like, we began in slavery. I was like, I didn't. <laughs> Maybe you did. I didn't. And I don't think that black people began there. And so it's helped me to really um, stretch time historically and, and call for a different kind of way of entering uh, debates and conversations and discourse. It's a great question. Thank you so much. No, thank you. I just had a comment. Yes, ma'am. I wanted to thank you for your book because it, ex it helped me understand the outrage and rage I felt walking into art history at a very famous school for their art history courses and walking out because I was outraged yeah. that nobody spoke of what these images right. were. And so I thank you so right. much oh, for it's, that. Uh, you're, you're, you're <laughs> it. Thank you. Thank you. That's right. <laughs> my other, my other thing Can I just interrupt you quickly? So my book was an accident. This was like a little private book that I had in my drawer, really. I wasn't planning on publishing this book at all. I was planning on publishing the Arctic book, and it was a long story, but somehow somebody got word of it, and I got an email and said, please send it to me, and I still didn't send it for another year. But um, it was because I wanted to email it all over the world. I was like DIY, like <laughs> poetry, <laughs> art history revolution. I'm going to send it to every woman in the world so they could like see the crazy that went on in the art historical canon. Like, you just can't, once you really get in it, you guys, I'm telling you, you cannot believe what's going on there. You just can't. Speaking of the archive, yeah, Chris, speaking of the archive, you can't believe what is going on there. And it's also like, you know, I go into a museum and I take the magnifying glass and go, oh my God, that's five black women carved into that flagpole and they're like <laughs> picking cotton. Did you know that was there? I mean, it was like that all the time. I, I'm not joking. All, I went all over the world for years with my baby on my back and magnifying glasses just going, are you kidding me? To the point where I would just start laughing. I mean, it's in the, when the paperback comes out, I'm not plugging my book, you guys, I don't care. I give a lot of my money away, so this is not what this is about. But when um, the paperback comes out, there's a, the 30, the, the essay, it's 30 pages that I just read from about Venus. Um, it talks about like how I would be in the middle of the night doing research once my kid got too big for me to travel with him. And I would just like, I remember just spitting up a whole glass of wine at three o'clock in the morning because I came across something that was just, oh, the clock, the clock, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. I was like, is that, what? Like, so yes, ma'am, sorry. I'm right there with you. It's so much worse than you can ever imagine. Oh, I should say one other thing. These guys were like, well, why did you decide to put that in there and not that in there? And I was like, you know, so the statuettes that I read, if, I, if there is a statuette that it's in there, that means I found probably 400 of them, 500 of them. The ones that were most common are the ones that got put in. Okay, sorry. I also purposely 
delayed going to Europe until I was more mature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because I didn't want, I didn't mm -hmm. want bowled over by how superior Western art was, and superior art yes. was to America, to you as a black woman. Yes, black. exactly. And I wanted to go and just see for myself. Yeah. When I went there, I was in Florence and mm -hmm. Paris, mm -hmm. to places mm -hmm. people go, mm -hmm. and I was bowled over because I kept seeing black African artistic philosophy all over the place. Absolutely. And it, it, it stunned me mm -hmm. because I could see it. Absolutely. And I wondered if you had... Absolutely. So that's funny. We have a lot in common. I refused to go to Europe for... I didn't go to Europe. I don't think I went to Europe until I was in my 30s or 40s. And when you do graduate work, you're, you're expected to go because why not? And I was like, no, I'm not. I'm going to go to these places first. India was the first place I went to besides Mexico out of the country. Um, and I'm so happy I chose only to go to places where brown people were for the longest time because I knew that Europe was this all-encompassing thing in the Western imagination, the Orientalist imagination. And so when I did finally go, I loved it because it didn't have the same weight at all. I was like, but I had been to the, I had been to India. You guys, I'm sorry, but I'm like an India fanatic as a Sanskritist, um, you know. You can't go and look at those temples and be, ever be the same. You just can't. I'm talking about the artwork, the sculpture. Um, and so I feel like uh, in terms of the historical timeline, whoops, that going into the ancient world, all over the world, put the, Europe's kind of starting with the Renaissance and moving forward, artistic uh, history in the proper context. And it was really wonderful. It's a great question. Yeah. But I think we should see it all. Yeah. Yeah. Any other question? Okay. Yeah. yeah, sorry about that. Um, so this one's probably going to be a doozy. Um, a dizzy or a doozy? A, a doozy. Fantastic. I, I love doozy. I always doozies. have like 80,000 questions at once. Great. Um, but two sort of themes I'm seeing that have been in your work are sort of this it's sort of like a catalog of invisibility mm -hmm. in your work, this long standing just theme of objectification and all that. And I'd like to know if, um, there's also, always take me I'm with time. you, right? I'm yeah. with you. Okay. So um, the big thing now in a lot of activist, feminist, social change circles is intersectionality. And as a person who's traveled all over the world, seeing these things, did you see that intersectional resistance at any point? Did you see anybody standing up and saying a counter narrative? Or... Is it okay. just abuse all the way down? Okay, so the thing is, well, uh, that's an interesting question. The thing is that intersectionality is not new. And mm -hmm. I've been trying to tell my students, like, y'all talking about stay woke and intersectionality. Intersectionality has been around for decades, founded by Kimberly Crenshaw, the critical race theorist. And if you really want to have your heads blown off, go back to the 90s and read critical race theory. That will put, that will put intersectionality in intersectionality, and I love Kim's work, is a cherry on top of the cake, okay? But there is a cake, and you guys, those people who are all into being intersectional, you are missing out on so much if you don't go back and read this stuff. You guys, the 80s and the 90s, now that I'm older, I know I sound like my father. He's like, you don't know what music is. I was like, you don't know what theory is until you read <laughs> the 80s and the 90s. But it is true, and I think Kim Crenshaw will be one of the first people to tell you that. Um, I'm so happy to see, it's very curious, I'm sure the people who have gray hair in this room are feeling the same way that I do. It is such a curious thing how things come back and when they come back. I did not see intersectionality coming back for the life of me. It was like this really sexy moment in critical race theory. It's brilliant, which is why so many people are attracted to it, but it was way too ahead of its time for the moment. So good for you. Just one second, ma'am. So uh, did I find places in the Western world, in my research, in from, so my book goes from 38,000 BC to the present, I should say that. That long poem goes back 38,000 years. Did I find instances of intersectionality that were healthy as opposed to abusive? Is that what you're trying to say? Essentially, yes. No, except, <laughs> except for every now and then. So for example, that's what I was trying to say about the cult of the black virgin, mm -hmm. right? I got to Christianity ready to get my head chopped off and cry for 10 years. I was like, this is the religion that killed its god and put him up on a cross and stabbed him 
Can you imagine what they were going to do to the black female figure? I just knew it was coming. And then I was like, and Hieronymus Bosch, who I love, but Hieronymus Bosch is a sick fuck, right? So I just knew it was going to be like all kinds of like, and Hieronymus Bosch did not let me down, I'm proud to say, but everybody gets treated equally in Hieronymus Bosch, right? Um, but there were no black female figures in Christianity, except for the Countess this, and this, like some, it was all royalty, some oddball black woman that somehow married some person, five of them, max. Other than that, there were no black female figures until, it, it, it's in this essay where suddenly something says, get up off the ground, you know? I'm doing my research, I'm looking all over Christian art like, where is she? Where is she? And I go, holy shit. She's the mother of God. Do you understand what I'm telling you, how odd that is after what I just read you, the ancient period? That then the black female figure through Egyptian, right, through classical Egypt, becomes the mother of God. She's the mother of God. I'm going to say it again. She's the mother of God. That is the only moment, and it is truly exceptional. And if you guys want to, like, really get your mind blown, go look. Just go Google the black virgin. So what's really interesting is that a lot of people will be like, the candles did it. <laughs> right? This did it. This did it. But if you talk to people like in Poland, they're like, no, the virgin's black. She's black. So that's the only place. And this is more theory, because I'm a big theory head that I try to hide it all in my book. I hide it in my poems. Julia Kristeva, who's a brilliant, in my opinion, uh, French philosopher, uh, has a great essay called Stabat Mater, after the painting, S-T-A-B-A-T-M-A-T-E-R. And she asks in this essay, why is the Virgin the only place where we all can come together and lose our basic neuroses and repressions? through devotion to her. It's a, it's a really interesting essay. So I think that would be the only place I would say. And then later, um, the paintings and artwork by black women all over the world. And the, mm, the saturation really started mid. I mean, there, there are oddballs who are unique, Alma Lewis, stuff like that. But then when you, not until the latter part of the 20th century. And then it's like on and pop and it's just beautiful. Yeah. Uh, I do have a follow-up, if you don't Go mind. Go ahead. Um, with 38,000 years of evidence that um, humans oh, are... Oh, good question. So the 38,000 are the Venus figurines, right? right? You guys know about the Venus figurines? So, okay. So in this time period, prehistorical time period, they, archaeologists started finding, and they're still finding all these, they call them Venus figurines. They don't know what the hell they're talking about, whatever, but that's what they call them. <laughs> And they have all these great names. But they're brown, and they have beautiful large breasts and beautiful large asses, and they were worshipped. And they find them throughout all over the planet. All over the planet you can find them. And nobody knows what they are. So I was like, I know what they are. No, I'm joking. <laughs> um, I decided to take poetic license and pretend that I know what they are and insist that we've been there forever. So that's one place that, because they, they were definitely ritual objects and used ritually. So that may be another place. 38,000 years and Christianity, that's it. <laughs> Sorry. Um, with such evidence, um, do you think we can keep the flame going? Now Absolutely. Are you joking? Look at where we're sitting. Let me tell you a story about Pasadena. I was hoping that uh, a friend of mine would come tonight whose mother was uh, named the Rose Queen in 1959. I said, you, I told you my family, a lot of my family uh, lived in Pasadena and still lives. First of all, two things. One is the pool at the, at the aquatic center that used to be just a pool for whatever. Black people couldn't swim in it only one day a week. They drained it after the black people swam in it because the water was polluted by the black body. Okay, one day a week, the dirtiest day of the week, drain, swim. Got that? Rose Parade Queen, 1959, they didn't know she was black, so they took her crown. Yeah? She was all ready to go on her float, and they realized that she was black. They didn't realize, I mean, you, whatever. And they took her crown. So that's in Pasadena. We can just start with Pasadena alone. Of course it's getting better. Of course it's getting better. My mother was walking in the woods when she was little in Louisiana, came across a little black boy hanging from a tree. Yeah, it's getting better. Does it feel like it's not right now? Hell yeah, because what's happened in this country in the past year. 
But you guys, I'm telling you, I can't believe I've become that old person that's like, you don't realize how good you have it. But I, I don't want, and I don't mean it that way. But, but we're almost there. And we were so much closer when Obama was in office. Obama was complicated, I know. I'm not, you know, I get it. But we were so much closer. And I'm just praying that this is the last gasp of fear and hatred. And, you know, it's going to throw some fits. And we're going to be right there with it while it throws the fits and then and just constantly say no and keep working. It's happening. It's happening. Are you joking? I mean, you just see every day I see things. I mean, did you guys notice? Did you guys pay attention to the election? Did you see who won? Uh, trans women? What? Are you joking? Out. I'm out and fabulous and trans, damn it, and I'm taking this office. That wouldn't have happened under Obama. I mean, the irony for me about Trump is it feels to me like he's, it, it, it pisses me off. It's like figures, American. So one of the things I talk about in interviews and also in this essay that's coming out is how it feels to me like we had to make our hate pretty in terms of art. That, that's part of the art historical project is that it makes hatred pretty. Like, a lot of the objects that I'm talking about in this book were actually fucking gorgeous. I mean, beautiful. I mean, they're made by masters. Of course, they're beautiful. But they're also racist as hell, right? And so that's, that, to me, is what it feels like to be America, American. You know, it's like you have this myth of democracy, this myth of nation. You're like, yeah. And then you're like, yeah. You killed everybody, starting with the First Nations. They're dead. The ones that survived, God bless them. Let's support them, you know? So it's, it's so much better. It's just that hatred takes a long time. Hatred takes a long time. Keep your fire going, sweetie pie. Keep it going. And, and, and take hope. Take hope in yesterday's election. And stay active. You guys, I hope to God you're voting. Some friends of mine tell me, voting's a, a, a right, not an obligation. I was, and then Trump got elected, and I was like, <laughs> yeah, that's right. 46% of you idiots didn't vote, and now you want to complain about Trump. Come on. Come on. Don't complain. Is voting complicated? Yes. Is it complex? Is it a panacea to everything? No, not at all. Not at all. But we have to stay active. Staying at home and being depressed is not going to help, unless you're staying at home and being depressed with people and writing letters at the same time. You know, I just uh, got the Poet Laureate ship of Los Angeles, for example, and it's very sweet. I'm, I'm so honored. A part of me was like, oh my God, why did I say yes? But anyway, um, but you know, I'm giving my whole salary back to the city to give it to more poets, right, who don't get enough recognition. This is confidential. Don't tell anybody. It's coming out in a month, right? So. What I'm going to, I'm trying to redefine the role of Poet Laureate, of Poet Laureate and, and, and instead of just going around giving readings, I'm going to instead try to do a Root, Truth, and Reconciliation Commission through poetry for the city of Los Angeles, starting with First Nations, right? And then going forward in the history of Los Angeles. How many communities of all sorts, all races, white people included, I'm not, I'm not, look, this is why I said it already. I don't think white people have a patent on hate. I, I think black people hate as much as white people. We are, everybody's messed up as far as I'm concerned, right? So I want to go through the history of LA and have a Truth and Reconciliation Commission that addresses all the ways in which certain Los Angeles communities have been treated unfairly. Let's put it that way, okay? And, have, and use my salary to give to the poets to do this project. So I also think that uh, giving is a very important thing, is my point. Philanthropy is very important. Poor people give more money away than rich people do. Do you know that? We're the, we're the most powerful givers on the planet. So it's important to put your dimes where your mouths are, too, and volunteer your time. I volunteer a lot. So don't worry. Just stay active, but don't worry. We got it. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? One or two more questions? I could stay here all day. I'm, I'm fine, you guys. I don't care, but... Yes, ma'am. So sorry. Good. You have given me the courage to keep writing about my history, Good. about my youth, Good. about my That's African right. ancestry. That's right. So I want to thank you for everything it's that you have given us pleasure, tonight. I wish I was in your classroom. Oh, I swear. Oh, my pleasure. <laughs> but my this pleasure. old gray-haired lady does not 
I have never heard the term intersectionality. Mm -hmm. Can you define it for me, please? Yeah, it's the idea. So it's a fancy way of saying that we have to deal with the whole body, right? I know, right? It's actually like not that deep, but okay. <laughs> It's a fancy way of saying that we have to deal with the whole body, that you can't just talk about race, you can't just talk about gender, you can't just talk about class, you can't just talk about ableism, you can't just talk about whatever, you have to put them all together. I, I prefer the term simultaneity. I'd, I'd like to deal with the whole thing at the same time. I don't think, I, I don't know how things that are whole can intersect, is what I keep saying. It's like, it's already a whole. You can't take it apart, There's, you know. So um, that's what intersectionality is about. Can't and talk about one without talking about the other. <laughs> right. And, and right now, and you guys, I don't mean this to be pejorative. I mean it as a term of affection. As a queer woman, we say the kids affectionately. So, and the kids are losing their minds over it right now. <laughs> and it's great. It's fantastic, right? Um, but I think the kids already knew it. And now they have a word for it. I think, I think that younger activists totally understood what intersectionality is. And, but intersectionality is such a sexy word that we like to say it again. Okay. Um, but they knew it. I mean, that's the thing I love about teaching college, right, is that my students are brilliant. My undergraduates are brilliant, right? They know intersectionality. They know theories. We all do, right? We're in a body. We're living on the planet. We know what we know. Mm -hmm. You know, we know our lived life. So they actually know it beforehand. You know, you know what intersectionality is. They just have a sexy name for it now. Okay, well, thank you. Yes, ma'am. My pleasure. Yes. So, uh, my question, unfortunately, I'm is so happy I get this on to older black women. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. Well, uh, my question isn't as sexy as all of the others have been. A few uh, weeks ago, I read part of your book, and I read Virga, and I sort of came to a standstill with it, and I thought, oh, this is really interesting, because um, she's uh, sort of created a modified sonnet. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm really interested in knowing, you know, how do you choose your, your, the forms for your poems? Oh my God, question <laughs> of craft, thank you. Um, I, I feel like the poems choose, the, the forms choose me, mm -hmm. not that I choose them. And God damn it, when they tell me they want to be a sonnet, I cringe. <laughs> it's hard, it's hard to write a, a, a strong sonnet. Yeah. Right, and to not have it announce itself as a sonnet. Like today, one of my students was like, every he wrote a sonnet, and every every line ended in a period and a rhyme. And I was like, dude, you can't do that. I mean, you can do that, but it would be really slick and badass if it was one sentence, right, or two sentences. But seriously, like, so that your reader doesn't realize you're writing a sonnet. Do you know? Um, I I really. I really don't like it when my poems ask me to write it. And, I mean, <laughs> it's hard. It's just, that, the other sonnet in my book, that took three years, 14 lines, okay? So, I mean, I don't even pretend that that's a good sonnet. I'm just saying just to get it on the page correctly is really, you know, it's difficult. Why, do you like to write sonnets? Fantastic. And somebody, they said to me not long ago, you should make that a sonnet. Mm -hmm. And I thought, ugh. And Do you have rhyming dictionaries? No, I don't bother to try to rhyme. I didn't bother to try to rhyme. You should. I use the poem. You learn so much. You learn so much. Bye. Mwah. Mwah. <laughs> Thank you, super fabulous students. Bye. You should get some rhyming dictionaries and try. And there's a great book. I just told my, the same student today about, edited by Ivan Bolan. You know the name of it? Something sonnet. Yvonne Bolan, Irish runner, writer, she, poet. She runs Stanford's program, B O L A N D. If you remind me, I'll, I'll give Emily in the name. I don't know if you, you don't go to school here, do you? No, no. Oh. Come up to me, I'll, I'll give it for you in a minute. Okay, yes, ma'am. I have a request. Yes. My hope and dream is that at some point in your life, you will provide an opportunity for more seasoned women I can't to believe be you're saying this. in your presence. I can't believe you're saying this. I just thought today I'm going to teach a free workshop for older women in LA because this famous actress came up to me at some swanky planky thing. I can't remember her name, but the moment she came up to me, I was like, oh my God, that's that lady, you know? <laughs> 
And she was like, I love your work. Do you think I could come and sit in in your class? And I was like, I think so, but I don't know if my job will let me. And anyway, you'd be a total distraction to my students. They all, every, the whole campus will recognize you and it wouldn't be good. But I, and she just wrote me again like, can I come and sit your class? I was like, oh God, what are we telling this like, famous actress? So I was thinking, wouldn't it be cool if I, um, she came all the way to Paris to hear me read. Isn't that crazy? I'll come wouldn't to it Paris. Be cool, wouldn't it be cool if I, maybe I'll do that as part of my poet laureateship. Thank you. Yeah. I read your mind. I want you to yeah. know that. You probably. <laughs> and I just registered. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you. How would I, how would I keep, I don't know how to do, I will figure out how to put that news out in the world, but yes, I will do that. I can always Absolutely, help you. Absolutely, I will Thank do you. that. Yeah. How are you guys doing? Yeah? You good? You had one question, you done? Or are you just raising your hand? You're good? Any other questions, comments? Okay, last one. Unless there was someone over here, did I miss, no? No, okay. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for your time. Sure. I feel your generosity just with your time tonight. Um, my question is about, you spoke of the memory as an archive. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to access the riches of the archive of memory? What does that mean to you? To me? Well, this, is, this kind of piggybacks on the, the, the idea of intersectionality, which I actually think doesn't go deep enough. It doesn't go into memory, mm -hmm. right? it goes only into the present, right? That I am standing before you as a woman, as African American, as queer, as whatever, right? But really what I am is a dinosaur or a mermaid. That's how I feel inside, right? Or I'm a ghost of my ancestors. Like if I really, really go there, right? All the things I just said that identify me, I don't give a shit about identity, you guys. I don't care. I know it's all sexy right now. Good for it. I don't care. Like, I don't care about race. I care about culture. Like, somebody said to me, I, I have to do something you know, with regard to race. I was like, I don't believe in race. I believe in black culture. You want me to talk about black culture? I'll talk about black culture till the cows come home. Best thing ever happened to me, right? But race feels to me like out there. Feels like a concept that came that's foreign, right? And so, for me, my archive is like the first time my father took me to the beach and I swam in the wave. Or sucking out a crab claw from filet gumbo. Or watching my father, who was big and fat and gorgeous, try to dance when he could barely get through the door. Or listening to the ways my family would say, come go with me now. That for me is like a billion gazillion times more interesting, more rich, more historically valuable than for me to sit around having conversations about so-called diversity. I don't even know what the hell that means, right? And so that's why memory is so, it's like, even if the memories are false, which often memories are, the older I get, I'm like, oh, I made that shit up, right? <laughs> I, I thought, I didn't think that was real. It's real, you guys. Watch your memories go, pew, it's, oops, it's going to happen. Just know it. But even made-up memories are historical artifacts. And they're, they're very interesting in that way, right? I, I'm a big Freudian fan. I know that's problematic. I love Freud. I know, I know. He's, 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 compli he's complicated. And I'm also a big Jung fan. Jung is all about projection, right? And what I love about Jung, and they part it ways, Freud and Jung part it ways, and what I love about Jung, Jung would say, you know, okay, it's not that we're supposed to heal the projection or the neuroses, necessarily. We're supposed to learn from it. The neuroses is a gift, right? So if I'm projecting all kinds of stuff onto you, whatever, like, you have on a baseball cap, he must be a baseball fan. You have on earphones, he must, blah, 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 whatever, right? That's about me. It's nothing to do, nothing to do, right? But the point is not necessarily, with young, the point is not to stop projecting, right? Not to go, oh, that's so wrong. I should, uh. The point is to go, that's so interesting that I think just because there's a baseball cap and earphones that that would, Right? I feel the same way about memories, even false ones. Even if they're inaccurate, they're historically true in a lot of ways. They're historically real, I guess. And so that's why I think the memory is such an interesting place to kind of backstroke through. You know? 
and why I think also, uh, I talk about this in an inter interview, if you go on my Twitter feed, it's just, it's like, I don't know, 20 something lines down, it's a post down, an interview with Matthew uh, Shepard, who's an amazing novelist, uh, and he has this whole question about narrative, that he asked me that, well, how can you call Voyage a narrative, because there's so many fragments, and I was like, dude, for like people who have been in some ways denied subjectivity, absence and fragmentation is the most constant presence, right? So for me not to have fragmentations and things be, like I said, weird and all that, that would be a denial of the actual narrative, right? Narrative, the narrative is a fantasy. It's as much, to me, narrative is, is colonial. To me, narrative is propaganda, right? To think that things are begin and end is bullshit. Do you, I don't know about you guys, but my life doesn't go A, B, C, D, E, F, G. My life goes X, B, D, F, G, I, K. <laughs> you know, to put it in fancy terms for the intersectionality people, Foucault talks about this all the time. To be postmodern is to be disoriented. Right? So that's why, I, that's why I'm so engaged with memory and historical memory and archival memory because it's a mess. <laughs> I like the mess. I like the mess, I guess, is a way to put it. I like that memory shows up in messy ways because I think life is messy. And I, I do not, in any way, I don't care if it's like, I went to Harvard and I, I was a research assistant in African American studies with some of the greatest thinkers of our times, Cornel West, Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham, Skip Gates, all those people, love them to pieces, they're like my uncles and aunties. But we would have great debates because I'd be like, no, this is like some propagandistic bullshit. And like it doesn't have to all be good. It doesn't have to all end in a little bow and we're gonna be all right. It doesn't, it doesn't. We, we can't get to, I mean this is why I think Trump came out of nowhere for so many people. Like, we were like on some propagandistic, we are the world, we shall overcome boat. And meanwhile, these fools are stockpiling thousands of weapons and they're trying to kill us all, you know? We have to like be willing to let the darkness in. I love the darkness, I love it. I love, think, I love answers, questions that can't be answered. I love historical ideas that are messy and, and difficult. Because then I think it's a more honest engagement of what it means to be human. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I think I'm done. And yes, I'm happy to sign books if you wanted me to. It's up to you about the, I'm sorry, but I'm verbose. I know. <laughs> Good evening. I want to take one more opportunity to thank uh, Robert Kothor everything. So thank you. <laughs> she will be hanging out for a bit. If folks want to have a conversation, there are books available for sale. Thank you for coming to the lecture series. Um, for those of you in Emily's class, she'll take care of you. So those in my class, I will see you. Is, is Wednesday before Thanksgiving next Wednesday? No. I'll see you next Wednesday. <laughs> Bye. Bye. I just had a conversation with my students. Wait, is it Thanksgiving? I totally don't know. I know. I don't know either. I'll let you see. If it's not, I'm not going to see you. I know. I'll, the last part that you were talking about, do I answer? Uh, uh -huh, that was, um, I can give, uh, I'm, you know, I could care less about that word or any of those.